podcast, and I am joined on this show by regular presenter of the morning commute in the UK, Clemence Chatelain. Hey, Clem. Hi, Kate. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's a little bit later in the afternoon there. It's 6.30 in the morning here in Las Vegas, but it's great to be here. Yeah, it's fantastic. I think it's such a great Great way to meet people in our profession from all around the world. So I'm very happy to be on the show. Yes, and it's great to have you here. And speaking of being all over the world, Clem, you actually speak five languages. And I've always thought, people are like, if you could have a superpower, what would it be? And I travel all over the world and I work with people around the world. And I'm like, actually, I just wish I could speak a lot of languages. So what are those five languages you speak? So uh, my family's French, so I speak French fluently. Uh, I grew up in Germany. So I speak German because I went to school there. And then obviously, as you can hear, I can speak English, which I learned at school. But at school, I also learned Spanish and at university, I learned uh, Mandarin Chinese. But I would say Spanish and Mandarin Chinese, I, I can get around. <laughs> but I'm not fluent uh, in those languages. So three, I'm fluent in. Yeah, that's still super impressive. And I know once you start to learn those, and it does make it easier to get around different languages. And you've also lived in four countries. Yeah, so I've, I've lived, well, France, Germany, in the UK, and I lived in China for a year. Um, so yeah, that's four together. I mean, I, I hope that um, with working from home and all these things, I can uh, convince my employer to let me live other places sometimes. Okay, we're still talking about how we want to travel. So I'd love to be able to live for a month, I don't know, somewhere for a month and just get on with my life. And yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, that'll be the super interesting thing. I mean, I've worked remotely for, I think, 15 years now, and I've worked all over the world and I started a completely remote business. And, you know, so I've been doing it for a long time. So it's been really interesting to see throughout the lockdown, other people being like, oh, yeah, maybe I could travel and do this. And employers starting to open up their minds to how that works. And look, it helps us think about how we can help clients across borders. And the fact that you don't have to be limited to who you work with from geographic location. Yeah, I think I think that's that's true. But I think uh, depending on the clients you serve, like the clients we serve uh, at Paradigm Norton are usually, I would say they're more tech, they're still technology, technologically adept, but the, we have some clients who will have access issues. And so we always think, oh, we're just going to do this by video and do this password protecting as a computer. But there is always guaranteed a few of them where it's like, what password protect document was this? <laughs> just send you the post. So it's always quite tricky issues sometimes. I'm all for implementing tech, but I do appreciate that some clients, they just need paper in the post and signing it and sending it back. And that's the most efficient way to get them to do something. Yeah. And for some people, it's the only options, even though I've been, you know, all about virtual for a really long time. Yesterday in the U.S. was Father's Day. And so I called my dad and he's going to be 70 on Christmas Day this year. And for the first time, he said he actually ordered a mobile phone. So he has not uh -huh. had a mobile like ever. He had one for work, but he retired 10 years ago. And it's like, it's just so funny that I'm all out here talking about technology. And my dad has never in his life sent a text or had a mobile phone. So never had a smartphone. So kind of funny. Yeah. I mean, I, I think with my family, they're all, I think my grandma, she's, she has an Apple watch and she has an iPhone and she has the iPad and she's all connected and virtual and everything. Um, but my other grandma, she, yeah, she's, she didn't even learn how to drive a car. That was, you know, it's just, just never had it, the internet. She doesn't know what it is. <laughs> yeah. No, that just emphasizes. So we need, we need financial planners to be able to relate to all clients out there, whether it's a technology thing, experience thing. Absolutely. So Clem, super looking forward to this show. And along the way, throughout the 24-hour global commute, this is a charity event that will be raising money for Quad A, which is the Association of African American Financial Advisors and Color of Change, both supporting the Black Lives Matter movement in the U.S. And the team in the UK is raising money for two great charities in CF Warriors, which helps kids overcome cystic fibrosis and the Stroke Association. And we'd also like to encourage people in any other countries to donate to a charity of your choice and then message us to let us know so we can add your donation to the total and really show what can happen when the global financial planning community comes together. 
So we're going to have more on those charity challenges later in the show. But Clem, what do we have coming up for this show? So on this show, we have an interview with Carrie List. Uh, Carrie has led FP Canada and before that, its predecessor, the Financial Planning Standards Council, since 2006. So he is very uniquely positioned to tell us about how financial planning is developing in Canada. We also are joined by Justin King of MFP Wealth Management and the Retirement Cafe podcast, uh, who is looking at marketing your financial planning business um, and with our marketing focus for this show. But first, we have the news with new model advisor, actually, Cityware, this show is brought to us by uh, Jake Martin. Over to you, Jake. Great, thanks, Clements. Uh, I'm Jake Martin, reporter at CityWire RIA uh, here in New York City. Uh, the city that never sleeps is uh, certainly living up to its name lately. Uh, illegal fireworks are being set off in soaring numbers uh, across New York City, often starting before sunset and continuing on into the early morning hours. And I can say that from personal experience. Uh, so for some people, uh, the fireworks kind of serve as a release after months of boredom and seclusion, uh, you know, in their apartments during the COVID-19 lockdown. Uh, for others, uh, they are a celebration uh, of the strides made during recent protests across the city uh, against uh, police brutality uh, and systemic racism. Uh, not everyone is a fan of all the pyrotechnics. Uh, the city has received more than 1,700 uh, fireworks complaints in just the half, uh, the first half of June, and that's 80 times as many as it received in the same period of last year. Uh, that's according to the New York Times. Um, so with the country's 4th of July celebration still nearly two weeks away, uh, it's not expected uh, that all those pops, cracks, and booms are going to be going anywhere soon, uh, which is bad news for my dog, who uh, is terrified. Uh, so. Over in the RIA space, uh, mergers and acquisitions are still happening, uh, despite a bit of a slowdown in activity due to the pandemic. Uh, we saw a pretty notably large deal uh, across the line uh, last week with Crescent Asset Management's acquisition of uh, Pagnato Carp, uh, which is an RIA and multifamily office uh, based in the Washington DC area. And they have about $2.3 billion in assets under management. Uh, so this was the largest acquisition to date uh, for Crescent, which has been aggressively buying RAs in key cities throughout the U.S. Uh, that's since its founding in 2017 uh, by a pair of private equity investors. Uh, so Crescent has nearly tripled in size through acquisitions uh, over just the past year or so. Um, they're a Chicago-based firm that now manages about $9.5 billion in assets uh, across eight U.S. offices, and that's including in Atlanta, San Francisco, Denver, Seattle. So we're talking pretty major hubs here. Uh, the firm uh, claims that it's now in the top 25 RAAs uh, in terms of size. Uh, Paul Pagnato, chief executive of Pagnato Carp, kind of touted the combination as, quote, a new paradigm uh, for wealth management by democratizing the family office. Uh, now, there's some skepticism uh, that has been expressed by uh, industry players about the motivations for Pagnato and his co-founder David Karp to sell. The firm had originally broken away from the wirehouse world uh, of Merrill Lynch in 2011 for Hightower Advisors, uh, which also happens to be a Chicago-based RA roll-up. Uh, and it had actually been going alone as an independent RA since 2016. So some kind of saw this as a bit of a retreat to higher ground to kind of take care of succession planning and tap into some capabilities that come, you know, with the scale and resources uh, that a firm the size of Crescent can bring to them. Uh, both founders are in their 50s. Uh, they will remain with the firm. Uh, Crescent's workforce now clocks in around 150 employees, uh, including Pagnato Carp's roughly 30 employees. Uh, and the expectation is that the Pagnato Carp brand will stick around for maybe a year or so uh, before there's a full transition to the Crescent name. Back to you. Thanks, Jake. Um, so really, as you were telling us before, the, the nuisance of the fireworks are really, really horrible. I have a similar 
story when I was in China, there was uh, there were firecrackers going on during Chinese New Year for a whole month in Beijing, and it went through all the nights and all the day. So I can very much sympathize with your with the pain uh, yeah. currently. Um, so next we have um, we have Chris Bud. So over to you, Kate, to introduce Chris Bud. Sure. So Chris is the host of the Financial Wellbeing podcast and the Initiative for Financial Wellbeing. And keeping on that theme, he's joining us for the Financial Wellbeing Thought of the Day. Chris, what do you have for us on this show? Thanks, Kate. Uh, hello, everybody. Hello, Canada, um, which is very exciting. Um, I'm also, there's lots of people doing amazing charity things, which we'll hear about at the end of the show. Uh, I'm doing a charity, Change Your Shirt to me, Another Horrible Shirt um, Every Time. Uh, thing. So um, this is my fourth one so far, so I hope you approve of the pandas. Uh, the Initiative for Financial Wellbeing is um, an organization, a new, a new institute dedicated to helping financial planning to focus on well-being, on helping clients to be uh, happier, not just wealthier. Interesting to hear that news about various wealth managers just basically gathering big lumps of investments and making money from them. For me, that is the opposite of financial planning and financial well-being. Um, I'm sure those firms do good jobs in that respect as well. He said quickly. So um, one little tip about financial well-being today, then uh, there's a psychological theory called the hedonic treadmill. Now, the hedonic treadmill is uh, an expression that describes how we things that we do have a positive or ne negative effect on our well-being, but it's only temporary. We, uh, the, so the theory goes, we have a set point of well-being, which we arrive at in adult life through our experiences of childhood. And um, that, that's our level of well-being is then set for the rest of our lives. And um, things happen to us like lockdowns and pandemics, which hit us below that level of uh, set point of, of well-being. So we are constantly, constantly trying to find uh, little hits of well-being to get us back up to that level. So if we buy stuff, for example, that gives a short term burst of well-being, but it doesn't have any long term effect. So financial planning and financial advice should be based around helping people to find meaning, purpose, motivations. And in that way, they can have much longer term lasting effect on well-being and reverse the effect of the hedonic treadmill and keep us up to our set point of well-being. So long term motivation, purpose, meaningful. Those are the words that should be behind every financial plan. Thanks, Chris. Uh, very insightful, as ever, your tips for financial well-being. Um, Kate is now going to chat next to Carrie Liss. So over to Kate and Carrie. Fantastic. Thanks, Clem. And Chris, I love pandas. I think more pandas everywhere can make the world a better place. So good on you for that shirt. That's great. So I am really excited to introduce our next guest, Carrie List, the president and CEO of FP Canada. He has been at the forefront of financial planning in Canada for the last two decades and is doing really incredible things. So, hey, Carrie. Hey, how are you, Kate? I am doing great. Thank you for joining us here on this global commute. And Carrie, before we get into what you are currently up to, uh, share with us a little bit about your career to date and how you got to where you are today. Sure, I'd be happy to. And, and what a great segue. For, I hadn't heard Chris's uh, the, uh, the, that, that story. And it's, it's a great segue because um, I have to say that I came upon financial planning honestly. And a lot of the reasons that uh, Chris mentioned around the value and the importance of financial planning really uh, were at the core of, of why I got into financial planning. I actually started my career as a um, I, I got a degree in math, so I had one of the very few bachelors of mathematics back in the in the day, um, and I started my career as an accountant. So I was a CA, CPA, um, and I really had no idea what I was getting myself into. And I, I worked as a CA for for five years. I did a lot of IT and real estate work, and you know loved and still love IT and and real estate. But you know, five years on, I realized um, I needed something more. I, 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 there was something missing. I was pretty good as an accountant, but, uh, and I, you know, I liked the business aspect, but I was brought up in a household that um, making a difference in society was uh, really ingrained in my psyche. And I wasn't getting that as an accountant. And at, at 29, Kate, I uh, you appreciate it. I, I think I quit my career. Um, I spent a year traveling around the world, um, mostly in, uh, in the third world, Africa and, and East Asia. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the old uh, trying to find myself. Uh, I came back, I, I hadn't quite found myself, but I knew I didn't want to go back to being an accountant. 
and still proud of, of, of being an accountant. But that's, uh, it was sort of the early 90s and I discovered financial planning. And uh, a friend of mine had asked if uh, I could come do some corporate workshops for um, a company that uh, had a contract with the provincial government at the time. Employees were all being downsized. This is in the early 90s and it was a, a terrible uh, recession, et cetera. And they were being act, uh, uh, offered uh, retirements and, and exit incentives and they needed some help through their, the, the, the financial decisions they had to make. And, you know, I'm allowed to say this as an accountant, we all, you know, accountants seem to think that they know everything. So I said, how, how hard can this be? And uh, I started doing these workshops and I realized how uh, very quickly that I actually didn't know two thirds of what I was supposed to be teaching these, these, uh, these folks and uh, really how much important knowledge and guidance uh, these employees were missing. Um, their lives depended on getting good advice. Um, these are life decisions. And, it, you know, just to Chris's point, these are around uh, their long-term happiness. And then this, this wasn't just financial. And to be honest, I realized that that was when I realized that I could marry all my, my accounting and, and math skills with making a difference. And that's uh, when I charted the path to becoming a CFP. Spent uh, the rest of the 90s really mostly helping transitioning some firms from deposit taking and mutual fund sales shops into financial planning firms. And uh, in 2000, I had the opportunity to start a financial planning degree program as their inaugural director at a, at a, at a college um, in Toronto. Uh, spent three years setting up their degree program and then um, FPS, FP Canada's predecessor organization uh, came uh, knocking back in, this was back in 2002, asked if I would uh, join them as their vice president standards and certification, jumped at the opportunity, became CEO in 2006, and 18 years later, uh, here I am today. So there you go. That's fantastic. And you know, I love that story about just quitting your job and traveling the world. I think everyone should spend time traveling, whether it's, you know, to volunteer somewhere, to go work, to go backpack. And your story also highlights the fact that financial planners come from all different kinds of backgrounds. And I love everybody's different story of how they find this profession. And Carrie, over the last number of years, I see you've done really great stuff at FP Canada. You guys are kind of revolutionizing a whole lot within financial planning. So tell us about your work at FP Canada and why it's so important. Sure. You know, it's hard to know where to start. We've been so busy the last five years on so many things. But I'd say FP Canada is really at the forefront of financial advice in Canada. Uh, our, our decisions and our actions are, are, are having a, a profound effect on the industry um, and also really on the wellness of all Canadians. So it's, 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 it's pretty far reaching. Uh, and in fact, this last year, we refined our, our, our statement of purpose. And I love the comment about purpose because really, whether it's organizationally or personally, without purpose, we have nothing. And, and so we've really refined our purpose statement. We, we say that our purpose at FP Canada is to champion better financial wellness for all Canadians. I think you could say wellness, but uh, we, we say wellness through better management of people's finances. And our mandate is to advance professional financial planning, not to advance the profession, but to advance uh, the, the service of financial planning as a professional service. And, you know, uh, if we look at uh, the era, the COVID-19 era we're in today, I think uh, with today's economic environment, it's, uh, it's more important than ever. Um, we've, uh, we've always known uh, at FP Canada that, uh, you know, consumers deserve to be served by true professionals and that financial planning really needs to be recognized as a profession for the benefit of all Canadians. Uh, I would say, Kate, we're not there yet. Uh, we're a long way from it. Uh, consumers really don't understand uh, how profound an impact app appropriate quality financial planning can have on their lives and not just on their finances, but on their, on their happiness and on, on their wellness. Uh, I think the financial advice industry is now only coming around 25 years on uh, from FP Canada's inception. And uh, they're realizing that sound ethical um, professional financial planning is the future of financial advice and, and, and the future of financial services. And I'm really pleased to say that we're leading the way in Canada. We've, we, uh, we confer the, the pinnacle designation for financial planning worldwide in Canada, CFP certification. We've introduced a new designation called the Qualified Associate Financial Planner Certification 
And Kate, you know, we had the word all in our purpose statement, uh, advancing, uh, uh, championing financial wellness for all Canadians. And CFP, reaching a CFP professional may be out of reach for a lot of average Canadians with more typical financial planning needs, but who still need and deserve the services of a professional financial planner. And that's where we introduced uh, QAFP. And, you know, I'd say next to sort of physical and mental health, uh, really wellness in general um, is, is predicated on being financially well, uh, well, and I don't mean rich either. I mean, it's having your finances in under control and, and being financially healthy the way you need to be physically and, and mentally healthy. And, you know, doctors have a huge impact on society and, and, and doctors have a huge societal responsibility. And uh, our, uh, our view is at FP Canada that financial planners are the family doctors of the financial services industry. And they also have tremendous responsibility. And uh, we take that responsibility seriously. And, and we make sure that the financial doctor is appropriately trained and skilled um, that we offer the appropriate training and, and, and to help them um, and that they live up to that tremendous responsibility. So it's a, it, it's a, it's a pretty uh, tall task and, and we're very, very uh, pleased to be at the forefront of it. Yeah, very tall task, but so worthy. And, you know, I mean, you and I know, Carrie, and everybody knows financial planning is still seen as elitist, but I love that FP Canada is kind of taking a stand and saying, no, it really is for all. And, you know, through creating other designations and through so much of the work you guys are doing at FP Canada and people coming into the profession and thinking, hey, what's my next career stage? And, you know, how can I work with people? How can I work with, you know, my own either people my age or with similar interests. And a lot of people are thinking, listening to this either live or on a recording, you know, should I get CFP certification? Should I go for it? So what would you say to those people that are considering making the leap and obtaining CFP certification? Well, look, you just, you just said it, you know, if, if you're, if you're listening to this and you listen to, to Chris's comments, you listen to, to what financial planning really, the future of what financial planning is all really, uh, really all about if you're interested in helping people get what they can out of life, helping them uh, make better financial decisions, better manage their finances so that they can live their life com more confidently, which is actually the tagline now in Canada for CFP certification, live life confidently. Um, then frankly, I think financial planning is a career for you. And I think Kate, you also mentioned people coming at it from different, different aspects. We're looking frankly at uh, trying to get universities to focus on programs that come out of uh, perhaps not the business and finance side, but the social sciences, because we think there's just a great opportunity there to, to bring a, a new breed in. And I, you know, I, I think in a second, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the future of financial planning and, and the skills that you need. And I think it's almost better managed through social sciences. But look, if you're interested in a career in financial advice, the future is all about financial planning, frankly. And if you want to be a financial planner, you want to become a financial planner, CFP for certification is the pinnacle of that. In Canada, QFP, a great place to start if, if, uh, if you're not, uh, you know, you want to go at it uh, gradually. Um, CFP, though, is the is most widely recognized financial planning designation around the world. Uh, in, in, in many countries, it's the only recognized financial planning designation. And I say for the most part, that is true in Canada. Uh, and it demonstrates to your clients that you're a true professional that you're always gonna act in your client's best interest. And, and that is critical. It's not about making uh, money, the money's gonna come. It's about doing right for your client. And that, I, there's a great book, I'll, I won't talk about this, but about being able to do well by doing good. I think it's a perfect uh, statement for, for financial planning. Um, and that you're willing to hold yourself accountable uh, for your professional obligations. Because if you wanna be recognized as a professional, um, you should be willing to step up and say, I'm going to be, I'm going to hold myself accountable. And so you, you'll be able to demonstrate to your clients, demonstrate to your communities, demonstrate straight uh, to the world that you really are a true professional. And, and I guess most importantly, you've got this great opportunity, as I did back in the 90s, to, you know, marry having a great career um, with all of the skills that uh, that you can bring to the table 
and feel good uh, about really helping others achieve uh, wellness. And, and that's a, I mean, what, what better career can there be than to take the skills that you have and turn it into doing good and make, and make a good living at it? Yeah, that doing well by doing good is just such a great way of summarizing, you know, one of the aspects of what makes this such an amazing profession. And Carrie, what would you say is happening in Canada at the moment within the profession that really makes you smile and proud to represent Canada on this whole global scale? It's, 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 it's been a crazy few years, Kate, in Canada, I must say. Uh, uh, the re we rebranded what was uh, Financial Planning Standards Council to FP Canada back in April 2019 was the official launch. And that was really to expand our scope so we could do more. So it wasn't just about setting standards. It was about offering quality professional education. It was about reaching uh, consumers more. Uh, we've just launched a pro bono program for CFP professionals to partner with members of, of uh, provincial parliament across the, the country to, uh, to, to help those in need. Uh, I would say though that the, the rebranding and launch of our, uh, the FP Canada brand and the FP Canada Institute a year ago last uh, April uh, was just a, a huge leap forward. We've had tremendous success with the largest employers in Canada, the big five banks as a starting point, um, and a lot of the, the independent shops adopting CFP certification. Now the new QAFP certification is getting great traction for those institutions realizing they still have sort of the mass market average consumer that they need to serve and that they need to, 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 to provide the, the professional advice uh, there. Uh, we've had record number of planners added to the designation in this past year. And um, that's been exciting. I think also, I should mention that after over a decade advocating for restrictions in law as to who's permitted to call themselves a financial planner, we finally have legislation that passed last year in one province, that's in Ontario. We have pending legislation just past second reading in Saskatchewan. And that's really, really exciting because we're seeing that governments are finally listening. They're finally hearing us and they're seeing that it's really important that financial planning uh, be recognized as a profession in law so that Canadians can be con uh, appropriately protected. And I, I think, Kate, perhaps what I'm most proud of is how the industry and advisors alike are actually buying into this. It's not a new message for us, but I think we've refined it and it's a new way forward. And they're buying into our message, which is that CFP and QAFP in Canada are now built because we've just completely redefined what it means to be a financial planner. And these programs are now built on what we call the 3H financial planning. It's kind of a cheat on an alliteration so I can remember what it is, but it's holistic, which I think we all could, can relate to that financial planning is all about the entirety of one's uh, 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 being, not just uh, whether your investments or your insurance, et cetera. The, the human side, which is really all brand new, and I'll uh, mention that in a second. And then the third piece, H, is honesty, but we're really talking about impeccable, impe impeccable ethics there. And, you know, I think the, the ethical and, uh, and holistic piece have always been there. It's that addition of the human piece that I'm most proud of and I think that excites me most. And what excites me most and what I'm most proud of is people are buying what we're selling. And that's that our new professional education programs required for both of our certifications now are built on human behavior, behavioral psychology, behavioral economics. They're hard baked right into the learning. Uh, they integrate real world scenarios that, that help students actually identify what this means in, in practice um, into their learning and um, you know, how the application of this new science works on the job to help them be better financial planners, to help them achieve better outcomes for their clients, and frankly, to help them have longer lasting, more successful careers as financial planners. And that's incredibly exciting. We're just in the early days, but uh, we, we have already uh, just under 2,000 students enrolled in our new professional education programs, which are just massive numbers and uh, the numbers are still rolling in on a daily basis and, and that's pretty exciting. 
It is super exciting. Well done to all of you. And clearly everything that you're doing at FP Canada is very forward looking. So going with that, what do you think the future of financial planning looks like? Yeah, it's, uh, I think we've been, I've, I've been probably saying this for, for over a decade and, I, and I'm really pleased again to see that I think it's really here that, uh, you know, the future um, financial planner needs to be able to offer true differentiation and, and added value to their clients uh, to separate themselves from what technology can do. Look, we all know that fintech's here to stay. Uh, we know that AI is is rapidly advancing. And, and frankly, if we looked at the old value proposition of being able to do better at investing your client's money than the next guy or gal, that uh, AI and, and, and fintech, they've already they've already surpassed that for, for, for the average person. The, the traditional value proposition for financial advisors is, is gone. Uh, and, you know, I think the future value proposition really lies in that human touch. And I think that, you know, what we're hearing now more than, than, than ever is that with the advent of, of, of AI, these skills are actually going to be more in demand because cons there's a little bit of a pushback. People are really, they're excited and they're willing to use technology, but they're more than ever missing that human element. So I think that uh, consumers are always going to want sage counsel. They're going to want reassurance, guiding light, you know, handholding that they're never going to be able to get even from AI, even if that AI voice sounds pretty human, it, it, humans know that they're not. And, and they, you know, we all need that human touch. So, I see the future of financial planning based much more on the behavioral relationship, human skills, much less on the technical. I think the technical is always going to be table stakes. We, we know that, but frankly, knowledge, um, financial analysis, asset allocation, diversification, portfolio rebalancing, these things are all going to be available at the touch of a button, Kate. And, you know, it's the ability of the planner to interpret that. So they've got to have the knowledge. They've got to be technically competent, but, um, they've got to be able to provide that humanity. They got to have empathy, the ability to hold their client's hands, so to speak. And uh, I think that's gonna be the, the, the future of financial planning. And that's gonna be the key to being success, successful as a, as a financial planner in, in the future. And that's sort of comes around full circle to why I think we need to find uh, future planners from perhaps other than just an alternative to an accounting program. Yep, definitely. No, I, I love that. And that's been something we've been seeing around the world is the need to look at those, you know, social sciences and social services and just the people that have Absolutely. a lot of those skills inherently for who we're bringing into the profession. And then for those that are already in it, you and I had a great chat on episode 34 of the Innovating Advice podcast on the need right. to evolve or dissolve. So yeah. Carrie, thank you so much for joining the Global Commute. Thank you for everything you're doing at in Canada to continue pushing the profession forward to make sure that financial wellness is available for everyone. That's my pleasure. It's been a lot of fun. Wonderful. And Clem, what do we have next on the show? So next we have our marketing focus with Justin King, who is going to share some thoughts on promoting the financial planning business. So um, over to you, Justin. How are you today? Very well, Clem. Thank you. Uh, lovely to meet you and, and chat with you today. So I am, um, I'm just going to ask a few things around what you're doing today because um, you have, uh, in the green room, you're talking, you have books, you have podcasts, and uh, it all ties into, uh, you also do work with the Kine Institute. So you're going to join us a few times throughout uh, this uh, global commute today. So I'm uh, first, I would like to chat about uh, um, the, the marketing focus you have, which you're doing in financial planning. So tell us how you've gone about finding your niche in marketing your business uh, in financial planning. Yeah, sure. And of course, it's niche for us and uh, niche, I understand, for our uh, American cousins. Um, so, you know, when I was setting out to start this business, I, MFP Wealth Management, I, I'd read a lot of books and I understood that we really needed to be very clear on who we served. Uh, and I had always traditionally had served anyone who'd walked in the door. You know, if someone came in and said, I need some advice, I'd try to help them in my previous career. 
but I, I could understand all these books I was reading and this uh, knowledge I was taking on that really it would be quite good to get a really defined audience. Who would that be? Who would I, who, who would, um, I could run a profitable business with? Who, who would I really well serve? Who would I enjoy working with? Um, and I looked around my community and I looked at the kind of uh, the clubs I was part of or the organizations I was part of and then kind of blindingly obvious really, but I, and I, I, I live in a fishing village called Mudderford in Christchurch on the south coast of, uh, of the UK. And um, it's traditionally, it's very close to Bournemouth, which is, uh, again, you know, Victorians used to come to Bournemouth to retire. And therefore, I looked around my community and I realized there was an awful lot of retirees. And a bit like the local fishermen would do, they would go fish where the fish, they would go fishing where the fish were. I, you've got to have a market to be able to go at. There's no point saying I only want to serve, I don't know, engineers serving in the British um, Air Force if there, are, if, if there isn't an Air Force base next, next to you. You either got to move yourself or, or, or that's a wrong market for you to, to go at. The next thing, I looked at the retirees, and of course, I didn't want to serve every retiree. There was only a certain amount of retirees who would have significant enough financial problems that I would be able to offer solutions for. Because that's, of course, what we all do. We all, we all provide solutions. Um, you know, a client is, is, is over here, and they want to get over there, and we want to help them do the bridge, I suppose, get them from A to B. And who were there enough retirees with enough significant problems for me to be able to help? Uh, and I, I kind of did some market research and I looked at that and I thought, you know what, there are. The other thing I thought, could I really love to work with these people? Were, the, were, the, were they going to be fun? If I was going to be doing this for the next 10, 20, 30 years, was I going to enjoy it? And I think that's got to be key to all of us. We're not going to serve hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, thousands of people, but the people we do work with, we've got to enjoy working with them. And in fact, if you enjoy working with people, of course, you're going to love it and you're going to put much more enthusiasm and energy into doing so. So was, it, was I going to enjoy working with retirees? And once I got to know them and I, and I, and I started to realize the reasons they'd moved, moved, a lot of people had moved to the South Coast was they were after a better quality living. They were after the beach life. They were after kind of sailing and holidaying and travel and community. And they were after, um, they were passionate about giving back. And, 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 and I started to understand what, they, what, they, what their challenges were. And also I was very enthused about this, this wonderful period that people had in their lives of this new beginning. And, and it's for a lot of retirees, I'm not saying it's for everybody, but for a lot of retirees, it, it's that next opportunity to do something quite different to the, to, the, to the thing that they may have done or the career they may have done for 20, 30 years. It's that, wow, we've, we've got a bit of financial wealth behind us. What is next? And that energy and that vibrancy that they would bring to the table um, was, 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 was fantastic. So, um, so yes, that's how I developed my niche. And if I was a 20 something planner today, I would look at a very similar thing. I would look at, okay, so who do I want to serve? Who do I want to work with? What skills can I bring to the table that these people are looking for? How can I get them from Island A to Island B? Can I walk with them on that path? Um, and what are, the, what are their needs? Are there enough of those people in your local area who want, who, who want your services? Um, and then have you got the skills, of course, to serve that niche? Um, and if you haven't, then is it possible for you to, to gain those skills? How do you become credible in that marketplace so that they reach out to you? Thank you. So speaking of uh, loving to and working with people that you like, um, obviously it's even nicer to get to then uh, invite them onto your podcast. So um, I would like to know, um, I would like to know a bit more about how you've gone about yeah, research and engaging guests into this podcast of yours. Yeah. So Kevin, if I could give you a little bit of a background to the podcast and the reasons it probably exists. Um, uh, and then, and then I'll follow on with the, with how we get guests, of course, but what we, what we started to do, we realized that um, as a lot of traditional financial planning firms, I'm sure across the world uh, only can serve so many people, you know, there's, there's, millions of people and there's only, you can only serve so many people. And therefore it, it has become kind of the um, financial planning has, has only really become available for, 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 well, for not for many people, I suppose. And therefore I realized that there was an awful lot of people who weren't getting access to the experts that I would get access to. 
So I get to talk to um, lawyers and attorneys and uh, medical experts and um, dietitians and dementia experts and, and, and all these different people who are who know a lot about what goes on in a retire in the retirement world. Um, but it was the preserve of a few. And therefore, I was like, I was slightly frustrated by that. Why, why shouldn't everyone have access to this knowledge that I'm getting? Or why should just my affluent clients who come to me get, the, get this knowledge? So we started putting on live events. And we, we, you may know, of course, and I, we all know that there are, there are financial advice in the UK um, has had a bit of a bad rap. You know, there's been some, some poor practices and there's a little bit of genuine suspicion, I think, from a lot of uh, consumers about whether they're going to get good advice. How do they find good advice? What is it? So I came up with the brand, The Retirement Cafe, um, really, so I could put on some live events free for the community. So we would hire hotel rooms and we would put on these events. And there was never any idea that we would be trying to sell financial products. We would not be trying to get them on board as financial clients. We, we, we didn't even want to really be associated with it initially. We just wanted to go, we're putting on this thing, The Retirement Cafe. Everyone's free to come. Uh, it'll put it on a nice hotel. I'll get an expert in to talk about wills or trusts or powers of attorney or dementia or um, uh, cruising or holidaying or independent living or paying for nursing care or whatever it was that we came up with. And we would put on these uh, free events in the community. And I would kind of host them, but I would then bring in experts to talk about whatever the topic was. They were a raging success. And, now, and I don't think just because they were free. They, they were a success because um, they were very engaging. They, people, uh, you know, people got to meet experts that they wouldn't have met before, ask them live questions, really pick their brains. We'd record them, we, we you know, shared, the, shared the recordings afterwards, and they were really, really were successful. After about a couple of years of doing that, we started to realize that, first of all, they were relatively expensive and time-consuming. Um, and I thought, you know, there's got to be a better way of doing this uh, how can we still get those kind of live events, but get this or get the same knowledge out there? And that's how the podcast was born, really, was basically to take the live format, which we still do occasionally, but take the live format and put it onto the podcast format that we could then get a larger audience and get, again, get more people to gain knowledge of financial stuff that's going on in retirement and also lifestyle uh, choices that they or lifestyle knowledge and choices that they can make by getting access to all these wonderful guests. Um, that we get on the podcast. Thank you very much, Justin. That was incredibly insightful. Um, we'll, you'll come back at, uh, on the 24-hour community show, so we'll hear more from you um, very soon. Um, so we're going to have to need to wrap up. So we just need to quickly check in with the uh, people who are undertaking our charity challenges. Um, so I think we're gonna check in with uh, Gretchen if she is here. Um, and with James, if he is here, but if not, um, I think we can, as, I might have to ask my uh, boyfriend who's also undertaking the Minecraft challenge and ask him how far we've gone. Uh, but I, well, what I can see, we are, we are just embellishing it, a lot of it, where I think we have the main structure done uh, for the virtual conference room. Um, we're going to, uh, however, we have that somebody else is doing a, a, a challenge and they has taken over from James Mousley with the tire flipping and that is our very own the next gen fitness coach who has coached us through the morning commute on uh, how to keep fit. So Steve, if you are here, uh, it would be great to let us know how you're doing. Steve? Well, it, it, it looks, oh, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't expecting you, so I was t-shirtless and thought nobody needs to see that. <coughs> so we have t-shirt number two, or two, t-shirt two. How Great. you doing? So how far are you? Uh, you're doing an Ironman challenge. So how, how many miles have you gone so far? 25 and a bit. Five and a bit. So well we're done. Fifth. Getting towards a quarter of the way there. Starting to get a bit delirious, but that's good. <laughs> can <laughs> can't get through, five, Justin will know this, you can't get through endurance things with full control of your faculties. They've got to go away, and then the madness takes over and it's fine. <coughs> That's all right. fine. We're all good, much happier than I was an hour ago. The worst thing's always thinking about it. 
it's always much better once you just get involved. But yeah, we're good. So, don't think I'll quite make it under five hours, but somewhere close to that. Looking forward to dinner. <laughs> might even have some beer later. I've been almost beerless or alcoholless all year because I had loads of things I was supposed to be doing and they all got cancelled. I couldn't think of a good reason to start drinking again, but I think I have just now. So right. we shall see. But yeah, we're Thank doing you, all right. <laughs> you guys are doing great. Loving your work. Thank you. See you later. All right, Kate, would you like to please wrap up the show? Certainly, just take myself off uh, mute there. So a quick thank you to the Charity Challengers. We are really grateful for the support people are showing so far, but we do hope to raise money for uh, as much as we can for our chosen charities. So please click on the links that are put in the chat to donate. And I will be back in half an hour uh, for the next show where we will have a guest, Rita Cheng from the US here. And I'll be co-hosting with Next Gen founder, uh, Next Gen co-founder Rohan Sivajodi, and I guess actually I'm looking at the clock. It'll be in 14 minutes, so we will see you back here in a few. Thank you, everyone, and bye for now.